When I stepped into the stream for the first time to fly fish, something inside me changed forever. I could feel the pulse of the river, its current against my legs. Upstream, a storm was brewing and gray clouds were rolling up the riverbed. An insect hatch was beginning and tiny bugs were coming up around me in the water. Downstream, a fish was rising as if to tease me. And even though I didn't catch a fish that day, the experience stayed with me. And one day, I was to become a fly fisher woman. I came from France. I was raised in a small town at the beginning of the Alps. So we had mountains and rivers and a beautiful lake. I didn't know anybody who fished. After I moved to Houston, I met my husband, who was an avid fisherman. On the first date, he took me fishing in a boat in the Gulf of Mexico. Man, it was fun. He would put the bait on. I would throw the line out and I was catching a fish every time I threw it out. That went on all day. I had a great time. I'm not sure he did. Then we moved to San Francisco and he wanted to learn fly fishing. We moved purposely very close to the Golden Gate casting pool. Well, he became very good at it. He entered a contest where the first prize was a trip for two to New Zealand and he won the first prize. We went to New Zealand. And on the first day of fishing, probably by mistake, I happened to catch the biggest fish of the day. And this was a tournament. People who had put the tournament together were in a quandary. They had prizes for everyday winners, but they never figured that a woman would win. So they quickly sent somebody out to find something to get me for a prize. And the next day, the headlines in the papers in Rotorua, New Zealand, where he wins the trip, she catches the big fish. What really made me decide to try fly fishing, because I always like to fish, is when I saw the panoramic view from the middle of a river. You can't get that anywhere. So when I saw this whole 360 degree, I had to learn how to fly fish because I like that view. And you can't have a crazy lady keep jumping in the middle of the rivers everywhere she goes. I better put a rod in my hand because they're gonna start thinking there's a crazy lady out there. You gotta come take her away. Basically, I grew up in Colorado and we grew up hiking and camping and we did some spin fishing. When I was in my teens, my brother and I decided we wanted to try fly fishing because there's a great heritage of fly fishing in Colorado. So we started out with the spin rod. We had a little bubble bobber. Then eventually stepped up to the plate at Wally World and bought our first fly rod. We had the privilege of working with some mentors, excellent guides, and eventually just sort of went into the obsessive world of fly fishing ourselves. And um, both of us actually became guides. You know, in my early 20s, I was working a lot, 70 hours a week, 
you know, several personal crises going on. <laughs> but really what happened, I'm standing in the river and I'm fishing downstream to steelhead, which is an anadromous fish, the fish that goes out to sea for a couple years and then comes back up the Columbia system. And I'm just thinking to myself, it could happen that I could catch one of these fish. I could actually swing a fly out and have this wild steelhead grab my fly. It really did change my life. And at the same time, I read uh, Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. I am a nurse. I'm an RN. I started working in hospitals when I was 14, and I think I saw people save all their fun for later in life, and then they didn't always get that uh, opportunity. So that was one day, and ever since then, it's just been kind of following after that. I was dating someone who fly fished. When he found out that I had the slightest interest in participating, he invited me to go with him on a trip where I had my first fly fishing adventures. When I realized that I wasn't going to have my friend to fish with anymore, and if I wanted to, to fish, I was going to have to learn to become independent and self-sufficient. No one wants to fish alone. Part of fishing is the companionship and the camaraderie, and of course telling the fish stories around dinner is part of the process. So I had known about Women's Fly Fishing Club for a long time because I have some friends that belong. This seemed like a natural, natural thing for me to get involved with. My son, who's in adventure travel, was leading trips in Ireland and said I really should come over and take a trip with him. And we were in a bus in Ireland and we passed a stream and there was a man standing in the middle of the stream fly fishing. He's facing upstream, the light streaming on him, and then he's casting into the upstream water. And, and there was just some cord that was struck in me to, to do the same thing. I like that fly fishing takes me out of the garden where I'm kind of in control and structuring things to just where Mother Nature has taken care of it beautifully and I just get to be you know, part of the fan club. A river is like life. When you float down the river, you travel with its flow, its uncertainty. There are broad, even stretches of water, moving forever forward. There are long avenues of curves. And as you round the bend, you can't see what's on the other side. There are impasses and smooth passageways. You accept what the river has to offer, because you must. You cannot change it for that day, that hour, that moment. And for a brief time, you become part of it. Fly fishing is many things, different things for different people. Some people like the feeling of a home territory, going back to the same places that they get to learn very well and feel very comfortable at. Other people like to explore, go to faraway places, Alaska, Argentina, New Zealand, exploring new waters, new territory. Some people like to go with friends and share the experience and the excitement. Other people like the solitude of going by themselves. And it changes even for the same people. There are times when I want to be with friends and there are times when I want to be by myself. There are times when I want to catch a fish and share it with somebody. And other times when I don't care if I catch a fish, I'm not there for that. I'm just there to rejuvenate myself. For some people, Fly fishing is the art of casting, is perfecting one cast 
until it's so beautiful that it feels like a dance. For others, it's learning new cast and perfecting those. For some people, fly fishing is tying flies, creating new flies, perfecting old flies. They don't even care if they ever go fishing. It's the art of the fly. For a lot of people, fly fishing is reading the old book and collecting the old book. The more closely they feel connected to the history of fly fishing and the poetry of fly fishing. It's a whole literature. Over 5,000 books have been written about the fly fishing. For some people, it's waiting as far as you can, where nobody else can wait. That sort of competition with yourself. For some people, it's catching the most fish. I caught two fish. How many did you catch? Four? Oh, well, yesterday I caught five fish. For others, it's catching the biggest fish. Whatever it is you're looking for in, in life, <laughs> you can find it in fly fishing. It's a very sensual sport. It engages all of your senses as far as taste, touch, smell, hearing, sight. But there's also a part of it that's very much a primitive, instinctive part of your soul. It, there's a hunt involved in fly fishing. So you're also using cognitive reasoning skills when you start to understand entomology and about reading the water and understanding the nature of the fish that you're actually hunting. You can come to this sport at any time of your life. Part of the aesthetic of this sport is the fact that anyone really can do it. There's so many different elements involved that you can, you can really hone in on one aspect or you can try to take the day as it comes to you in a very spontaneous and creative manner or you can take it very philosophically and, and just experience what's given to you in the day. Some of the reasons I love fly fishing, the first of all is the way the sunlight dances on the water. Mother Nature, some of her most beautiful places are where rivers go through. Trout, everything in their world has to be perfect. The water, has to be perfect. The insect life to support that river has to be perfect. That means the plant life also has to be perfect. It can't be soiled in any single way. Trout can't survive. So fly fishing, especially for trout fishing, puts you in the most ecologically perfect, most beautiful places anywhere throughout the country. I was making the analogy between fly fishing or catching a fish and relationships because when one goes to catch a fish, the most important thing that all the books and all the experts tell you is presentation. You have to put that little fly right where that trout is. You just have to keep letting the line out there and letting this little fly drop as a tasty morsel for, for the trout to come and take a nibble on. And then once you've hooked a fish, you have to play it properly. Because if you jerk on it too much, the fish will break away. If you don't jerk on it enough, the fish won't take the hook. So once the fish has taken the hook, you have to play with it. And oftentimes let it run free down the stream for a bit. And then carefully haul it back in again. And let it go. And then haul it back in again. And it, it's a slow process kind of like getting to know someone, you know. Then when you have the fish close enough to you to put into your net, it's a, a very gentle, slow process. The removing of the hook is done mindfully and carefully. You have to wet your hands and you prepare yourself. Be gentle with the fish so that when it's released, it's released without harm. I don't know if that's an analogy for relationships, because <laughs> oftentimes that isn't the way it works. There's kind of a thing about the tug or the hookup. It's your first physical contact with the fish. And that is quite exciting. And it's everything you've brought to the table to get that fish 
to be either tricked, fooled, uh, titillated, teased, or irritated to take what you've presented to him. And that's the first handshake. I think that something that's very attractive to me is the being in this world and waiting for something from this other world to just present itself. I don't feel too terribly sorry for the fish sometimes because I'm thinking that maybe it's a little adventure for them too. They're out just for a minute and they see this world and we get to see them and then we put them back and they swim off happily and, and it's just been such a great moment of joy to be in each other's worlds for a second. When I first started guiding, I thought, oh, I've got to show everybody and they're going to love it just like me. And you don't have to be this crazed person to enjoy fly fishing. I have seen a lot of people just come to fly fishing for a couple days a year or whatever, and that's good for them. But for those of us where it does go off the deep end, I think that we get addicted to that charge that we feel. We really only get to feel that when we're fishing. And there are a lot of people that don't feel alive anymore. Oh my God, it's a big one. <laughs> oh my gosh, look at him. Look at him. He is, he's shaking. He's just really something. <laughs> The yogini steps to the top of her mat. And casts a fly into the river. To see what the day will bring. She casts with concentration, precision, and effortless energy. She casts without expectation, judgment, or predilection. She anticipates not what will be, but rather what could be. She casts because of the miracles and the mystery. She casts because of the unknown. And she savors the moment. Fly fishing can sometimes be a little different experience for women than it is for men. I think for men sometimes it's the conquest, it's the physical challenge. You know, frequently when I'm guiding or if I'm teaching a gentleman to cast, sometimes he's going to physically force it to happen. Women frequently will be more engaged with the whole experience or looking at the whole thing or trying to understand it. They're very good about taking instruction. Many of the gentleman guides that I work with teasingly say that they really love when they have women clients because there's an element where they'll stop in the middle of the day if they don't understand something they'll ask a question. They will really try to listen and try to execute the direction. A lot of times they'll just sit back and take a breath and go, oh my god, what a beautiful day. Would you look at this? Look at the flowers over there. Look at the mountain. Look at the Tetons. They're willing to sort of look at the whole day and the beauty of the whole day. When Golden West Women Fly Fishers was started, which at this date now is almost 25 years, I asked people in the industry what they thought of the idea of a woman fly fishing club. And I just got such positive feedback. At the beginning, the mixed clubs were not too enthusiastic about us being a women's club. And there were some snide remarks being made even when we went fishing, there would be men fishing down or in a boat where they made fun of these women trying to catch a fish. You know. But in fact, after a while, when men saw that we knew how to cast, we knew how to catch a fish, we knew how to release it, they changed. They approved of us. And with that came a very strong support from the community. And interestingly, I'll tell you, before then, when a woman went into a fly fishing shop, she would be the last to be helped. She was unseen, practically. 
the, the salespeople in a fly shop would always take care of the men coming in and the women were standing there. After that, fly fishing shop hired women salespeople, sales lady, and women was well accepted as clients. The next thing that happened is the industry took notice. If you remember, when we were fishing, women had to borrow or use a man's old discarded waders, wading shoes that didn't fit because they were too big, the rod that the husband or the boyfriend didn't want anymore. Now the manufacturers started to make waders for women, wading shoes for women. Some of the rod makers were touting their rods as for women. We became a presence, a very nice presence. There was only one other club in the country, and it was an old club of women in New York. 25 years later, there are over 40 women's club. But the great thing about a women's club is that there is a connection between women and a way of being that is not there when it's a mixed club. And women can get into emotions and feeling with other women that they don't do with men. It's just that between women, it's different. And that difference is what has connected so many women and brought in so many new women into the sport that if they just had to this depend on their husband or their boyfriend, they wouldn't have. Let me just say this. I think that men have finally accepted the fact that we are here to stay. One thing that we talk about when we teach our guide schools, and especially our women guide schools, and, and what we have noticed with women groups, women tend to be caretakers, and they tend to dedicate all their time to everybody else. And so all of a sudden, there you are, and you're having this time by yourself, and you're out there in an environment that maybe you would have never, ever thought about. So what happens with women, they're beyond their comfort level. A lot of uh, women have not had those outdoor experiences. Sometimes it, it's uncomfortable and sometimes it's emotional. And also women don't tend to take a lot of time for themselves. And so all of a sudden you have this time and you're fishing on a river. But in that time, all of a sudden you start to feel things that maybe you haven't felt in a long time. I think that's why this is a sport, a passion, a lifestyle that really is attracting women now, which is so great to see, so, so great to see. One of the reasons, I think, that more and more women have gotten into the sport is because the sport has become much less bloody. You catch a fish, and now it's very well accepted that you release it. It's called a catch and release. Now, for a while, there was some controversy that it was a cruel sport because you are using a hook and you're hurting the fish. And in some case, the fish may even die if you release it. My feeling is, and I don't know if, how well supported by science it is, is that the hook, particularly when it's barbless, which means you've pinched the part that would really stick in, usually is caught in a part of the mouth of the fish that doesn't have nerves. Therefore, we think that the fish is not hurt. I also think that the catch and release has made a big difference in the sport. Uh, women are much more comfortable releasing the fish and knowing that the fish is gonna be there for our children and grandchildren. Oh, I'm so excited about women getting into sport. These guys knew in the early 1700s and 1800s, you know, when they sat out there and they're dapping their 
their little fly on the water. They knew that long ago and kept it a secret. Honey, I'm going fly fishing. This is what we men have to do. Of course, she said to us, okay, honey, go right ahead. Well, baby, move over because those rivers have been discovered and there's no way you can hide this secret anymore. Mama has come. <laughs> A river offers many challenges to its traveler. There are pockets of rough water you dare not enter. There are swift passages with rocks and boulders. Sometimes the boulders are too large to go around. There are back eddies with cross currents that confuse you. And blissfully, there are long, still, calm waters. And the waiting is easy. A river responds to forces of Mother Nature. It can seem angry, menacing, foreboding. It can be vigorous and energetic. Sometimes it's lazy and languid. It can be full of solace and reflection. And it can be full of hope. Well, in my book, I think it teaches you patience. If uh, anything is gonna go wrong fishing, it will. The hooks will get snagged, the line will get snarled, you'll hook a log, you'll hook your waders. So you have to learn to be patient and you have to learn to expect that things aren't always gonna go your way, which is of course another lesson in life. And I think another thing that to me has become apparent is that one needs to get into the rhythm of nature. You need to be mindful of the place that you're in and the conditions. Another thing that has become very apparent to me is that nothing stays the same. So if you think that the fly that you had on 10 minutes ago is still applicable, and the wind has changed, and the hatches come up, then you have to be prepared to be flexible and make changes as well. So it teaches you flexibility too. So I was learning how to fly fish, learning skills, but it was a moment on a stretch of river, to this day believe it was like a nirvana. The day was beautiful, it was in June, the river is prolific with insect life. Beautiful elephant ears. I swear the little flowers were like little orchids and wild berries. Now I finally walk into the river. The river looked almost like topaz. The way the sunlight would hit and dance through it and I could just see the, these gold reflections. At that moment, that precise moment, of beauty and mother nature. It was a perfect moment for me. It made me realize that there was something wrong in my own life at that moment. And it had to do with, I've been in radio broadcasting over 20 years in the world of promotions. I worked hard and I played hard. But I, it wasn't until that moment I realized there was a middle. I had a really a life-altering change. 
so much, in fact, that when I came back, I walked right into him and I said, I got to quit. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do. My world is so stressed that I don't know when I'm not out of stress. Day in October finally came and I went to Dunsmuir for my birthday. Finally, my guard is finally down and I turned around and I had a heart attack the night before Thanksgiving. But fly fishing changed my life because there was something, something that told me that day that there was something wrong. It helped me recognize that I was about to die and uh, I didn't. Being a, a fly fishing guide, I have some very special clients. And in time, in 15, 20 years of, of guiding you, you get to know people. Like I have some very good clients that are fighting cancer. And my very good friend, Flory, who in her mid-60s has gone through our guide school and she also teaches for casting for recovery, which helps women with breast cancer, learning how to fly fish, which I'm very much involved with. Two years ago, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and that's a, that's a tough one. And so when she's undergoing treatment herself, she's thinking about, I can't wait to come out to Montana with Lorianne. And that's what gets her through. That whole idea of being present with fly fishing becomes really important. Those cumulative moments, for, for me as a fly fishing guide, most rewarding thing I can do in my life. I had a unique experience with uh, a woman last year who was one of our breast cancer survivors with Casting for Recovery. She had been in remission. This was her second bout with breast cancer. And, and frankly, we don't know if she's going to make it through this next year. It's, it's going to be a big challenge. So it was a real privilege to have her out in the river. She was so excited to be out there casting. And we did hook into a nice fish. It was her first fish on a fly rod. So it was a real honor to be there when she had that experience and she did a great job fighting the fish, and we netted the fish, and we, we held him in the water. I just told her, I said, you know what? You caught this fish, it's your privilege now to let him go and let him live. It was really something because I, I held the net for her and I showed her how to hold the fish gently and wet your hands and make sure he was okay. And, and she held that fish in the water just for a brief moment, and he settled down. And I said, just cup your hand underneath his belly, and he'll let you know when he's ready to go. And she held him right there, and he just parked right there between her legs just for a couple of minutes, and then just swam off. And she looked up at me, and she said, how like life. definitely a spiritual side to fly fishing. 
and and for me it's connected with what I personally believe which is um, it's being in nature so all the creatures around us you know whether they're the creatures that we're hunting with a fly rod or flipping rocks and looking at the bugs it doesn't really matter all of it is part of God's creation and it's all a part of our privilege and responsibility as stewards to protect and I think that we are part of that creation obviously but we've also been given that responsibility to take care of it. I think that it has to do with feeling one with the world. It's not an intellectual thing and I think you can get there by degrees. The time that I felt it the most was once when I was on the Madison River and I had been out probably past the time that was the best time for fishing. The fish weren't rising anymore. I could hardly see the water. I was just becoming part of that dark light and almost atomized into the scenery. Everything was kind of becoming the same color. The water, the banks, the bushes, me. We had become this painting. There's this painter called Russell Chatham who does these great big canvases and they're very, very muted colors where they all just kind of come together. And at first I didn't like them, I didn't appreciate them, but now that I've been out in that kind of light at the same time of night that he depicts, I know exactly what he was getting at and I feel like it's a very spiritual thing to just kind of dissolve into the scenery and to be feeling like you're just one with it. No distinct edges, no real sharp images. There's nothing there in the sensory part to tell you that you are distinct from anything else. For me, I actually felt it. And then to be pulled out of it, initially I was happy, but then at the end I was sad to have not been able to stay there longer. Something happens when you're fishing, and I think that we try to articulate what that moment's all about. And for me, I was raised Catholic. And, uh, I went back to the church after 25 years to talk to a priest, and he goes, where have you been? And I said, I've been on the rivers and in the mountains and on the lakes. And so for me, that, that's where God is. That's where I'm present. It's a gift, like that closeness with yourself. There's a, an intimacy about fishing to one fish. And um, a couple of years ago, there was a fish on Flat Creek that was kind of driving me a little crazy because I just couldn't get him to eat, couldn't get him to do anything. And so I really structured and set aside half of the season, which is a very short season on Flat Creek. And every time I would fish, I would go over there and try to find him, watch him. But one day I just simply sat across from him and for about two and a half hours, I just watched him. I didn't present a fly. I didn't throw anything at him. I didn't move. I watched how he dealt with his environment. I was able to see what his comfort zone was to pull out of the bank and what he liked to do when the sun started to change, what kind of food he would come up and take. In that amount of time of just sitting there and just being in his, in his environment, sitting in the water with him and just observing him, it was a tremendously intimate experience. I had learned a little bit about his particular individual personality, about how he engaged in that little tiny two foot by six inch window that he lived in at that particular time of year. And when I did finally catch him, it was a particularly special moment. Never need to fish to him again, but I do go and look for him. And it's interesting because I know where he is, but now that I've caught him, I have no desire to really even present a fly to him anymore. There's, there's kind of a gentleman's agreement between the two of us. I, I really respect him. He's a magnificent fish. He's beautiful. But I'll go by and I'll sit down across from him for a few minutes and then I'll leave him alone. When you are out in the river, particularly when you're wading in a beautiful river, surrounded by mountains and trees and birds and flowers, and you are focused on your casting first and then on catching a fish. You think of nothing else. It's like meditation.
you're just one with nature. You're out there doing something that's pleasurable and a great sense of satisfaction. You're not there to prove anything. It's also a, a sense of getting away from it all and just being who you are. Fly fishing has given me an appreciation of nature's cycles and the delicate balance of the environment that nurtures those cycles. I now understand how the health of a river is so intertwined with our own. And I have seen how that health has been compromised by erosions, toxins, diseases, and water diversions. I worry about what will be left of our rivers in the future, unless we can restore them to the way they used to be. Like life's passages, the cycle of a river flows through eternity. It begins as a snowmelt stream on the mountain that runs continuously downward into broad stretches that find their way to the sea. At the sea, the water becomes the rain and returns to the hills of its youth to become the stream into which we step to embrace what we have found through fly fishing. <laughs>